Hello there, my fellow friendly vampires, and welcome back to some 40k lore. In today's episode on our Legionis Astartes organization, we're gonna take a look at one of the most prestigious, loyal, and beloved of legions. None other than the Blood Angels. Fortunately, structure-wise, these guys do have a lot of lore. And I'm certain that everyone watching, or listening, myself included, are gonna learn at least something new about them today. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? In all of their incarnations, the Ninth Legion defied the standard by which the Legionis Astartes were measured. In their earliest of days, they operated with such a simple order of battle and command structure that they could barely be called an army consisting only of massed infantry companies with few specialist troops of any kind. Most often these troops were equipped as reaver squads, optimized for close quarters and wielding arms requiring limited resupply. The aberrant quirks of the legion, the red first which haunted its warriors, would wreak havoc on their discipline and made any attempt at large-scale organization very difficult. Tactics were often developed and employed at the company or even squad level during combat, rather than being part of a bigger, legion-wide approach to strategy. This unique manner of operation, fighting at a distance from other units and with limited oversight by the early Imperium's Divisio Militaris, served to limit the impact of the legion's more aberrant practices on the morale of allied units. As such, there was no concerted effort to bring the Legion into compliance with the others of the Imperial host, and it was a matter of tacit complicity among the various generals and commanders that fought alongside the Ninth Legion that it was to be allowed to operate in a manner of their own choosing. Their first commanders were more warlords than actual officers. They enforced discipline at the point of a sword, earning respect with the strength of their arms, and they walked the battlefield as visceral forces of nature. When these respected commanders advanced, the warriors of the Ninth Legion followed. When they held the line, their followers dug in, and when they laid down their weapons, those around them ceased the killing. It was a brutally efficient structure, one that could be impeded only by the infliction of massive casualties, for even if one warlord fell, there were a dozen veterans ready to step forwards and take his place. Of course, and fortunately, this was all to change with the return of Sanguinius. The Primarch was to bring a sense of order to the often fractious legion, stamping a new structure onto it in the hopes of containing their hunger. Although in essence this new order would seem to be in accord with the Principia Bellicosa, in actuality it also varied a great deal from the standard pattern. It would retain the basic structure of companies, initially forming the legion into 200 companies of about 300 Astartes each. Although by the final years of the Great Crusade, this was increased to 300 companies of 500 warriors each. However, past this basic structure there were many discrepancies, each chosen by the Great Angel to serve a purpose in his plans. The companies were grouped into hosts for campaigns that required greater shows of force than possessed of a single company. Although each host was a temporary creature broken and made as tactical needs required. Sanguinius then created the spheres, three of them to encompass the hosts, three chambers by which he would give command and purpose to the warriors of the legion. Each was separate and distinct from the 300 companies and the strictures of the Principia Bellicosa. They formed a distinct strata of organization which allowed the transhuman warriors of the Legion to focus their hunger on a single objective, and conquer it too. This was not only a blunt tool, but an elegant and artful plan, designed to promote the finer qualities of the Legion while providing an outlet for the more base. It was the masterwork of the Great Angel, the fulfillment of his oath and the salvation of his children. Thus, the outermost of the three spheres, the third sphere, would encompass the rank and file of the legion, the warriors that plied the blade and bolter on the battlefield. Known in the legion as the Malak, the warriors had but one duty, to fight at the order of their officers. They obeyed, they killed, and they practiced their arts granted to them by the Primarch. 
Within this sphere, there were but a few distinctions, simple titles and orders for those who excelled in specific arts of war and peace, exemplars of their tasks and angels of small actions. These were the marksmen, the poets and the duelists of the legion, their strong right hand and beating heart. And though these were small honors, they were held very dear by those who won them. The second sphere was composed of the commanders and leaders of the legion, the powers and the dominions that stood at the side of Sanguinius. To them fell the duty of command, of the execution of Sanguinius's orders with alacrity and judgment. Unlike those who fought at their command, they bore the burden of free will, of time to think and ponder as they would while the curse still stalked them. They were the planners and strategists of the Crimson Host. They directed battles and wars as lesser men directed symphonies, utilizing each instrument of their command at their fullest. As the rank and file found peace in their studies, so too did each of the mighty become a master of many disciplines, those of the pen and brush as well as those of the blade and gun. Although they were not the single-minded fanatics of legions like Angron's Red Reapers or Rabut Gilliman's famous tacticians, there were still few who could match them in the art of war. Finally, the third sphere, the final demarcation of Sanguinius's new legion, comprised the ranks of the Immortals. These warriors stood in the presence of the Primarch. They didn't operate as one of the 300 companies, but as guards and servants to the great angel himself. Each one, when inducted into the ranks of the first sphere, gave up his common name to take on another, and gave up his identity to do the work of the Primarch without guilt or regret. They were Sanguinius's wrath, his stern resolve and his watchful eyes, given form and purpose. Upon these warriors he depended for the most dangerous tasks, to fight upon those battlefields and to act upon those errands that would tarnish the soul and bring the hunger roaring to the fore. By the armor of the new names and persona that the warriors of the first sphere wore like their own, they would put off the toll of their actions and emerge from their service untarnished, to take their place in the ranks once again. The first and maybe the most famous of the first sphere were the Sanguinary Guard, the honor guard of the Primarch himself. But of course there would be others, each assigned to a specific job and duty. Authority in the Legion was strictly divided between the three spheres, with each officer operating within his own place in the manner given to him by the Primarch. This strict, overlapping system of authority was less flexible than other Legions, but it afforded a solid line of responsibility and control that limited the effects of the Blood Angel's ever-present hunger and rage. To mitigate the possibility of any breakdown of authority, the Blood Angels maintained a great number of junior officers, lieutenants and sergeants of varying degrees, all quickly able to take a place of the slain in the heat of battle. On the field of battle, the line of authority was always drawn clearly for the Blood Angels and followed absolutely. To disobey or question an order was a grave sin, undertaken only in the most serious of situations and warranting the most difficult of punishments, even if the disobedience was proven correct. In the Blood Angels, all authority stemmed from the Primarch and flowed from him, first to the Lord Commanders, who led the largest divisions of the Legion, then to the Captains, and beyond in an unbroken and inviolable line. This fact kept Sanguinius's Legion centered and focused. Each word from a sergeant in the heat of battle was a word of Sanguinius himself, each nod from a Captain a tilt of the Primarch's head. The Blood Angels also differed in smaller ways. Those who held command positions over hosts and had authority over lesser captains were known as Archines, rather than the old title of Praetor. Within a company there were several junior officers, the so-called Powers, who commanded the rank of the company at war, and the Virtues, who stood as the exemplars in other endeavors. Many were known by the focus of their devotion, Archines of Wisdom, powers of the blade, with these distinctions a mark of respect as much as a tactical designation. By the last years of the Great Crusade, the Blood Angels were among the most preeminent legions of the Imperial host. In the years following Sanguinius taking charge of the legion, he had achieved its full revitalization, 
a change so complete that barely anyone remembered the old Revenant Legion. Once the half-forgotten rearguard of the Great Crusade, they were now at the forefront of every advance, and those who used to scorn them now sang its praises in every court of the Emperor. It was a mighty fighting force, a breaker of empires and an ender of worlds, and unshakable in their loyalty to the Emperor. It was the strong foundation upon which the Imperium was built, and while it still stood, the Imperium would never fall. At any given time, the Legion numbered more than 120,000 warriors, and accounting for casualties, they always made up for the 300 companies. Each of the hosts comprised a force predisposed towards assault and orbital drop operation, with a large proportion of their infantry equipped for close quarters combat, and their vehicles greatly rigged for high-speed strikes and breakthrough actions. With few defensive assets in comparison to other legions, they were at a disadvantage when committed to a large-scale conflict without operational initiative. But at the apex of the Great Crusade, such situations were nigh on unthinkable. Their force was spread across a galaxy in many different hosts, each engaged in large-scale operations, as well as custodial forces of each legion's main base and redoubt. The main worlds being the worlds of Baal, Saif, and Canopus. No, not that Canopus. From all these bases, obviously Baal was the biggest. For while the second moon stayed sacrosanct for the native blood, the empty, rat-scoured world it circled above was transformed by the Mechanicum of the Forge World Anvilus at the invitation of Sanguinius. There, where no unmodified person could stand unaided, the tech adepts built a manufacturing site at the envy of other Forge Worlds resupplying much of the munitions and technical needs of the entire legion. Also, as the homeworld of Sanguinius, Baal warranted a great standing guard, a duty fulfilled by the Crimson Paladins, although at any given time at least one company could be found there refitting. Canopus also served as a manufacturing center, although of lesser size and sophistication, still producing vast amounts of shells and other munitions to feed the cannons of the legion. It was also a common stopping point for troops bound outwards for the Great Crusade's front line, and many units were to be found here resting. Scythe was the smallest of the Legion permanent outposts, only serving as a source of recruits from among the world's endlessly warring tribes, and warranted but a single squad of Crimson Paladins as custodians. The fleet assets of the Legion were very impressive as well, boasting more than 300 capital warships many of them above heavy cruiser displacement. Many of these vessels were outfitted to serve as orbital assault craft, mounting either banks of heavy linear cannon for use as bombardment tools, launch rails for swarms of drop pods, or vast hangar bays from which the Stormbird and Thunderhawk gunships could operate. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate for you on the organization and structure of the Blood Angels for today. I gotta say, I actually really like doing these structure overviews, as almost always I find out something new I didn't know before. And this coming from a guy who did read the entire Horus Heresy saga over the last 15 years or so. Anyway, I do hope you too learned something new about the Blood Angels today. As for Legion specialists like the Sanguinary Guard or the Crimson Paladins, I will be making a separate episode at some point in the future. I initially wanted to cover them today, but it turns out that the Sanguinary Guard alone warrants their own video. Anyway, do share your thoughts on them in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and I wish you all a healthy and awesome day. The Emperor Protects.